Be seated tonight as we continue. I'm glad you're here for our midweek Bible study and time of prayer together. Uh, if you're here for the first time, you'll want to have a handout. And I see a couple of brothers with handouts. If you missed one, if you just raise your hand high and they'll get one. It looks like we're pretty well covered. I don't see any hands, guys. Uh, keep it up, though, if there is one. All right. Um, let me just go ahead and we'll begin our time in prayer. Now, our Father, we thank you that you are our salvation. Without you, we're absolutely nothing. With you, we're everything. And we thank you for our justification that in a moment's time, you've credited to our account the very righteousness of the Lord Jesus. And a day will come in a moment's time in the twinkling of an eye when you will change us. And our salvation in terms of body, soul, and spirit will be completed. But in this interim time of sanctification, you have taught us to learn sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, to renew our minds, that we might be able to make a defense for the hope that's within us, that we might be changed by the truth of the word. And so in this hour, we ask your blessing over it, that the Lord Jesus in every respect would be honored and glorified. We ask it now in his name, amen. All right, um, we are doing a series, a short little four-week series in the coming future judgments. And this, I hope, will be the last night, and then we'll go back to where we were on our basic discipleship as we look at the crown of righteousness. But I pushed the pause button because of a plethora of questions that people have, because many of you grew up in churches where there's just one big judgment. Uh, the Bema toss, the judgment of the just, uh, the judgment of the sheep and the goats, the ju great white throne judgment, it all happens at the same time. And if you deny God's role for Israel, you really can't come to any other conclusion but that. But if you interpret the scripture for the second coming in the same manner that you interpret the scripture for the first coming, what we would call a historical, grammatical, contextual, plain interpretation, then you can come to no other conclusion. And so sometimes people will apply that principle for interpretation for the first coming, but not for the second. And so they spiritualize or allegorize truth that refers to Christ's future judgment and his future return. But there's no room in Scripture to do that. How do we know our hermeneutic? That is, hermeneutics is the a 50 cent theological term that is used to describe how we interpret the Bible. How do we know how to interpret the Bible? God contains within the Bible how to interpret the Bible. So for instance, in Daniel 9, the prophet is reading the prophet Jeremiah, the 25th chapter, trying to discern how long they'll be in Babylon. They'd been there for decades. And as he's pouring over the prophet Jeremiah in the scroll, he reads 70 years. So how does he interpret it? Literally. And so when you see either Old Testament prophets interacting with each other or the New Testament interacting with the Old Testament, they always apply a literal hermeneutic. By that, we do not mean that we don't recognize similes. Something is like this. Uh, we were in the Bible line on... Uh, Tuesday, and we mentioned that we'll be like the angels in heaven. We won't be angels, but that's what some people have in their mind. Oh, he's an angel now. No, he's not. There's a fixed number of angels, holy and elect and fallen, that have rebelled that God has made never to create any more. That's a simile, or sometimes there's a symbol, but the symbol is interpreted within the Bible itself, and then once you interpret the symbol, you believe it literally. So we're not dismissing figures of speech. I am the bread of life. He's not a loaf of bread. I am the door. He's not a four by six door. So we're talking about a contextual, historical, grammatical, literal interpretation of scripture. And so as you do that, we have noticed, here's a chart, and we'll just keep the chart up if they're able to bring it up. I know, I wasn't sure if they were able. Yeah, there it is. Just leave it up the whole time, and then on occasion, I'll refer to it for those who are live streaming. And we have quite a number who live stream in other parts of the nation on Wednesday. But this chart is right here. 
in your uh, notes tonight. And so you can see the next event in God's prophetic schedule is the rapture. Now, some people think the next great event is the second coming. They're called amillennialists. There's just one big return of Christ, and that's it. Again, you have to allegorize, spiritualize all kinds of scripture to come to that conclusion. The church, and by the way, everyone believes in the rapture. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, the rapture is held by just this weird, quirky group of evangelicals. No, everyone believes in the rapture. It's just like, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, everyone believes in election. The question is, how do you interpret election? How does it unfold? But everyone believes in election because it says he chose us before the foundation of the world. That's a fact. The question is, how does God choose us? And so some who teach replacement theology that God's done with Israel, like John Calvin, looked at Romans 9, 10, and 11, and he didn't see Israel, he saw the church. God selected Tom to go to heaven. He selected, I won't name a name, to go to hell. <laughs> and so uh, that's what he said. And he, he believed that people, some people were incapable of ever being saved. That's a poison, in my view, to the heart of evangelism and to the character of God. It's a slander. And so everyone believes in a catching up. We shall all be caught up, harpazo. In the Latin Bible that was used for nearly a thousand years of church history, we get directly from Latin and English our term rapture. So everyone believes in the rapture. But for some people, that's the next event and that's the last event but not if you apply the scripture literally. And I hope you'll see tonight when we look at and summarize these different judgments that we've been studying, they're so different, they can't be the same where you're consistent. And so there's a space of time, we don't know how long it is, weeks, days, months. It appears to be very short, where the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy does not kick in until the one world leader He's best known by the term Antichrist, a term used only by John in his first epistle, but there's over 30 names given to him in the Bible, in the Old and New Testaments. We study that in God's prophetic schedule. He signs a peace treaty with Israel. It's never happened, ever. So we just write those scriptures off from the prophet Daniel and say, well, they're not gonna happen. And the Lord himself in Matthew 24 references what Daniel speaks of. He protects Israel for the first half of the seven years. That assumes Israel's back in the land, which they were not there for 1900 years. God could have pulled this off at 500 AD and then he would have maybe had a greater space between the rapture and the coming of the Antichrist and brought all the Jews back to perform the final seven years. But he's done it in your lifetime and my lifetime. It's amazing what we are living in this time in human history. Seven years long, in the middle of the 70th week, the 70-week prophecy is found in Daniel 9. And if that's not familiar to you, I have four messages on that in our Daniel series. So he gives 490 years of Israel's history. Everything but the last seven years, and the last seven years are still future. And that period of time in the New Testament is called the tribulation period. It's divided into tribulation and great tribulation. The middle event is when this world leader goes into the temple and makes himself out to be God. At the end of the seven years, there's a small, small, small space of time because no man can know the day or the hour. If you know when the treaty is signed, then you can say exactly seven years to the date, 42 months each half, set 1260 days, you could pinpoint it. But no one knows the day or the hour. So he said, when you see these things that he describes in Matthew 24 during this seven year period, you know the time is near. Luke says, look up, your redemption draws nigh or near. It's not here, it's near. But it's going to happen immediately after the tribulation. I don't know if it's a week after or two weeks after. And people give all these theories, but no one will be able to precisely say on this day. And then the second coming happens to the earth. That's the second coming. And that starts a thousand year reign. The concept of the Messiah reigning on the earth 
is not a New Testament concept. It's found all the way through the Old Testament. And, and it's believed by the apostles at the ascension of Christ when they're on the Mount of Olives and he's getting ready to leave. And, and they say, Lord, is it at this time that you're gonna establish the kingdom with Israel? And Jesus didn't say, oh no, that's all over. I'm not, I don't, there's no kingdom for Israel. The church has replaced Israel. He doesn't say that. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the epics. And so the kingdom is not dismissed. The fact that it's a thousand years long, that time frame is what's new in the New Testament. So at the second coming, so there's a judgment that happens while we're in heaven. It's called the Bema Seat. It's for Christians only. And so if you look on your handout, we studied it. Uh, the, the judgment seat of Christ, point A, the time is after the rapture. The place and basis of the judgment, it's in heaven. It's based on how we served Christ. So remember, this is not a judgment to see if you get into heaven. That's settled by grace alone through faith alone. But it makes a difference how you live for Christ as a saved person in terms of your reward. And the result are rewards to praise and serve God with. We're going to look at that in depth in the final tail end here of this uh, handout that we're working on on Wednesday nights. That happens in heaven. We come back rewarded, and we studied that last time. And at the second coming, there's two more judgments that take place, and they don't both take place on the earth. There's the judgment of the Jews. The time of the judgment is at the second coming of Christ to the earth. He sits on his throne when he does it in Jerusalem. The place is on earth, and the judgment is based on whether or not you know Jesus, have, ha have had faith in Christ. And we looked at some passages from Ezekiel and other New Testament passages, and the result is you either enter into the kingdom or excluded from the kingdom. So not all Jews are saved, only believing Jews, but he can say collectively all Israel will be saved in the sense that the majority of the Jews will acknowledge Jesus as Lord, but not every Jew. And that's clear from Romans 11 and Ezekiel 20. Um, then there's the judgment of the Gentiles after the tribulation as well at the second coming. The time, next page, at the second coming of Christ to the earth. The place and basis of this judgment is it's on the earth. If you remember, look at Matthew 24. I, I, again, I don't want to linger and review everything that we've done. But for instance, in Matthew chapter 24, and we'll hit on a few of these verses uh, later this evening, he, he's very, very clear when he describes this, or Matthew 25, he says in verse 31, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. So it's what's pictured in the Old Testament when Messiah comes back at his second coming, he's going to rule where? In Jerusalem. And again, the thought that it's a thousand years long, that's just taught in the New Testament. But the fact that the Messiah will sit again on David's throne, that's a New Testament doctrine. And so we've been in the time of the Gentiles. Jesus spoke of that. The time of the Gentiles began in 586 B.C., with Nebuchadnezzar coming and removing the Jewish king. There's never been a Jewish king since that time ruling in Israel. The next king who will rule on David's throne will be the king of kings himself. So that judgment took place on the earth. Um, and again, uh, it's based on faith in Christ. It's displayed by how they treated the Jews during the tribulation. So remember, we went through that whole thing. He's got those on his left, the goats, the sheep on his right. He's separated them. And he'll say to those on his right, you know, uh, you visited me in prison. You did this, you did that, you did that. And then when did we do this, Lord? Whatever you did to the least of these, my brethren, you did to me. So there's three groups of people. There's goats who are in the end condemned and thrown into the eternal lake of fire. And there's sheep who are welcomed into the kingdom. And the third group is my brethren. Who is he speaking of contextually? Jewish people. So remember, God said for all this to happen, this final seven years, Israel has to be in the land. And because they weren't there for 1,900 years, many assumed, well, maybe Augustine and 
Calvin and Luther was right, that the church has replaced Israel. And those guys were right on a lot of things, but they were woefully wrong in their eschatology and their study of last things. Now you got guys like Augustine who will say, you know, on the essentials, unity, on non-essentials, there's some latitude and all things love, to paraphrase him. But if you read his writings, like on the kingdom of God, he scorches any living believers who believe that Messiah is going to come back, that he's not done with the nation of Israel and God will rule on the earth with the Jews. So, I mean, he didn't really apply the very thing. But it's somewhat of a half-truth in that when God speaks of something that's true and doctrinally, it's not a non-essential. Take baptism, for instance. There's infant baptism, there's post-conversion baptism. They're not both right. Somebody's right, somebody's wrong. There's no in-between. Now, is baptism a test of salvation? Certainly not, it's not a test of fellowship. It's an act of obedience and it's assumed in places like Mark chapter 16 that a true Christian will do it, but he's writing that in the context of the first century where people understood baptism. But it's so convoluted 2,000 years later, people don't know what to believe. But again, they can study the scriptures and see it for themselves, it's clear. But somebody's right, somebody's wrong. So do I say, well, baptism is not essential, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't make baptism a requirement for membership. There's only, by the way, two requirements in the New Testament for membership. One is conversion, that you're a member of the universal body of Christ so that you can become a member of the local assembly, and baptism. That was your confession of faith in the first century. Nothing beyond that. And I know churches have these 20-week courses and you have to believe these five points of Calvinism and this and that to become a member of the church. That's just folly. And those churches that do that typically don't see anybody saved. I mean, how can you put all that together as a new Christian? It sometimes it takes years to put that together. So do you for years say, well, you can't be a member. We're not going to shepherd you and care for your soul. Can't do that. But those are churches that are just typically shifting Christians from this church to another church, and they very rarely see actual conversions. It's the exception rather than the norm. So there are some things that are essential, and if God has spoken concerning these judgments. You know, I don't want to get to heaven and God, if I was a Presbyterian infant baptizer, but I had the gospel, and I said, well, Carl, you know, you, you, you were in the ministry for 50 years. For 50 years, you baptized little infants. For 50 years, you misrepresented the plain, simple, clear truth of Holy Scripture. It's there, it's clear, and 90% of evangelical Christians worldwide do not practice infant baptism. They practice post-conversion baptism. So it's the exception to the rule. And there's a reason. Because the plain, simple reading of Scripture is clear. You, you, you have to read into the text something that's not plainly there. So I don't want to get to heaven and say, well, you misrepresented an important part of the Great Commission for 50 years. So it's not a non-essential in that respect any more than the things that we're studying concerning the return of Christ are non-essential because when you understand eschatology, it changes your life. What brought the great revival in America, the first and second great awakening? It was eschatology. It was the study of last things where they revived the the doctrine that the church is distinct from Israel and it resulted in the conversions of thousands of people. So we saw that how people treat the Jews, again, the Jews have to be back in the land. My brethren, it happens in Israel. In fact, the prophet Joel tells us it happens there in the Temple Mount in front of the Valley of Decision that today we call the Kidron Valley. It's to call that in the New Testament. So if you look at the Temple Mount, you see that dome. You're standing on the Temple Mount, you look directly across, you see the Mount of Olives. In between that, there's a valley. 
That's called the Kidron Valley or the Valley of Decision. That's where this judgment is going to take place, according to the prophet Joel. The New Testament describes it in great detail in terms of what will happen. The liberal takes that and teaches salvation by works. Oh, yeah, God's going to look at your works. And where, again, that would contradict what Jesus taught all the way through Matthew's gospel. You're saved by grace alone, but the grace that saves is never alone. Your life changes, and if your life hasn't changed, especially for these people in this seven-year period, because what's going to happen to the Jews? All the nations of the world are going to go against Israel. All the nations. That's what the Old Testament prophets wrote. That's what the New Testament affirms in the Revelation. Are we seeing the setup for it? Of course we are. The Jews are back in the land. And there's an anti-Semitic spirit that is growing and deepening and broadening, not just in America, but across the planet. And when the church is raptured, all hell is going to break loose. You talk about hatred for Israel. And so what happens? Christ will separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep will enter into the thousand-year reign of Christ. Where the goats go? They go to Hades, according to the text, Matthew 25, 46. How do they enter into the millennial reign? In their natural bodies. And the curse is seemingly taken off of the creation. Men live to be a thousand years in their natural bodies. If I were married to Audrey and I was a tribulation saint and I got saved during that period of time because I had never heard the gospel before in clarity and power and we got married and we lived for a thousand years, we could have a lot of kids. <laughs> And my kids could have a lot of kids. And the whole earth is going to be repopulated. And Jesus is going to be ruling. Why is he going to rule with a rod of iron, the prophet Isaiah says in describing Messiah's kingdom? Because the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-grandchildren of believers who enter, because only believers will enter the millennial reign, will have to make decisions for Jesus. Will they all? No, they won't. How do we know? Because what happens at the end? Who's locked up for this thousand-year period? Satan's locked up for a thousand years. And God, I think, among other things, is illustrating that man is a whole lot more fallen. You can't say like Flip Wilson, you say, well, the devil made me do it. No, you did it all by yourself, you know. And, and so he is locked up, but he's loose at the end of the thousand years. And who does he tempt? The children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren of tribulation saints who did not bow to Jesus as Lord. And then the graph goes further. You have the great white throne judgment. So let's look at the great white throne judgment, and then we'll try to kind of pull all of these together. So turn to Revelation chapter 20 for just a moment. Revelation chapter 20, and then we'll compare and contrast these, and we'll bring it in for a landing. Um. Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15 is kind of a central passage for this judgment, obviously. We read in verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. So earth and heaven flee away. What do you read in 21.1? A new heaven and a new earth is created, which is a real problem for the Christian who buys into theistic evolution. Because what God did in six literal days, at this point, he's going to do in a moment's time. He's not going to take six days. He's going to speak a new heaven and a new earth immediately into existence. And so between the new heaven and the new, what happens to the old earth? Second Peter 2 tells us God burns it with fire. You're living on a planet that someday is going to have a total meltdown. And sometimes I go for a walk to take a study break, and I'll pick up some trash. Trash just disturbs me. I don't know why. And I'll say, Lord, I can see why you're going to come. You're just going to burn the whole planet. There won't be anything left. Uh, I went for that walk at the end of the day, and there was 40 young people. And what, what's going on? Oh, we lost our friend. These are high school students. What happened? She was shot to death. I haven't even read in the paper. I don't know which of the schools or... So I said to one of the kids, I said, was she a Christian? One girl said yes. 
And I have no idea, you know, whether that's a true yes or a fake yes. But I just went on yes. I said, well, let me just say what's going to happen. They gave me the outside pulpit, 40 high school students, maybe 10 parents. I just talked about the Lord and the promise for the true Christian and what will happen, you know, to someone that really knows Jesus, that she's absent from the body and she's present with the Lord and God's going to raise her up someday. And, and we grieve, but we don't have to have a hopeless grief. We don't grieve like those who have no hope. And I shared the plan of salvation. Everybody listened. I said, can I pray? Yes. And I prayed and... I don't know why I went down that rabbit hole. Yeah, just, just, just because someday God's going to burn this whole planet. And he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. So during the time of the millennial reign, there's a rejuvenation of the planet. And you read of some of those chapters in Isaiah, but then there's a super brand new planet that's totally different. Look, I don't want to buy an old car with a new paint job and some fixed up seats, uh, you know, I, I, if I want to get a brand new car, so to speak, and God's not going to put me on some fixed up planet, he's going to create a new planet in which righteousness dwells. He's going to burn this planet into oblivion. And so I saw a great white throne, 2011, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence heaven and earth flowed away and no place was found for them. So this is like the end of time, so to speak. God is brought up from the grave, out of Hades, every single lost person. And we'll see in just a moment that the only people present at this judgment are lost people. There's no saved people here. The end result is that they are cast into the lake of fire. And so please note, he said that he saw a great white throne. Great speaks of the power of the throne. White speaks of the purity of the throne. The throne of God is so intense in its purity that the seraphim, if you remember in Isaiah 6, they have to cover themselves as they say in the Trisagion, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And so it's a terrifying place. Heaven and earth is fled away. A new heaven, a new earth is made. And so during this in-between time where the old planet is destroyed, the old universe is destroyed just before God creates a new universe and a new earth. And on the new earth, the new Jerusalem, we call that heaven, absent from the body, present with the Lord, where? In the Father's house. That place called heaven, we did three messages on in our series in Revelation, is literally, physically, actually going to sit on the planet. That's just the capital city of the whole thing. And so in this in-between time, there's this great white throne judgment, and no one can hide. Adam and Eve sinned, and they go into the garden, and they hide behind the rocks and the trees, so to speak. No one can hide at this judgment. That's the place that's between heaven and earth. Notice the one who's doing the judging, verse 11. And I saw him who sat upon it, whose presence is so awesome, so terrifying, earth and heaven fled away. So who is the him? Which member of the Trinity? God the Son. He's not the Lamb of God. Here he is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's not the Savior of the world. At this point, he's the judge of the universe. You say, Pastor, how you, can you be so sure that this is not God the Father or God the Holy Spirit? Um, if you were here for our Revelation series, you might have written out in the margin, John 5, 22. Let me read it to you. For not even the Father judges anyone but he has given all judgment to the Son. Acts 10, 42, Peter is sp speaking, and he says that uh, Jesus is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Or Acts 17, Paul's on Mars Hill, and verses 30 and 31, I think it is, he says, God has overlooked the times of ignorance. He's declared to all men everywhere that they must repent. Why? Because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world, having appointed a man, Jesus, by raising him from the dead. So the one who saved the world and people who ignored his savorship, who ignored the provision that was made for them, he will judge them. And he will do it with fairness. Notice again the people who are present. 
Look at verses 12 and 13. We read now, and I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Circle the word S on the first books, and then another book, singular, was opened, which is the book of life. And by the way, it's also called the Lamb's book of life in the Revelation, same book. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, how? According to their deeds. Now let me pause here and define some terms because someone was asking me a question as we went out last week about various resurrections. There's two kinds of resurrections in the scripture. Two kinds. There's the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the lost. Or sometimes the resurrection to life and the resurrection of judgment. If you drop back here to verse 4, look at verse 4. Um, Revelation 20, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who'd been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus, because of the word of God. By the way, this never happened in the first century. So what is your amillennialist? So he just spiritualizes all of this. You, you, he says everything happened in Matthew 24 and 25 by 70 AD. Everything happened in Revelation, for the most part, already historically. The text says they get their heads cut off. And it says it more than once in the Revelation. Do you just spiritualize that? These are people who stood for Jesus. They're called tribulation saints. These are people who are saved after the church is removed. And those who had not worshiped the beast or, or his image, who's the beast? The Antichrist, right? One of his popular names in the Bible. They refused to worship him. They had not received the mark upon their forehead or upon their hand. What's the mark? 666. Revelation 13 underscores that. And in Greek, like in other languages, every letter in Greek has a numerical value. So alpha is one, beta is two, and so forth. And it grows. And so you can take the Antichrist who nobody knows who he is because we can't know who he is until after the church is removed, Paul says. So anyone who says, well, I think the Antichrist is so-and-so, they don't know. In fact, they usually pick some really famous person when the prophet Daniel says he's a little horn, he's diminutive in, in stature, he's an unknown person who quickly rises to prominence. And it made me think of President Zelensky, because I've been in Ukraine, I don't know, 30 times, Vince's probably been there 40 times, and I never heard of Zelensky, and all of a sudden this famous Jewish president came out of nowhere, and he's like a rock star worldwide. That's what the Antichrist will be like. Right now he's unknown, but in a very short time he will be known. And he'll ask people to take his mark. Remember in the first half of the tribulation period, as we studied Again, in God's prophetic series, there'll be a one world religion. You can believe whatever you want. So the Pope last week, right? He compared religions of the world to languages and dialects. Just like many people speak many languages and dialects, even so there are many religions. The Hindu has his way to God, the Sikh has his way to God, and, and the Christian has his way. That's utter heresy. That's beyond belief. But that's setting the stage for this one world religion that is coming. It's in front of us, but halfway through this seven year period, there's exclusivity of worship. It's no longer acceptable to worship Muhammad or Jesus or whatever figure you want to, you gotta worship me. And the worship program is so tight, you can't buy or sell anything unless you take the mark. Well, these Christians, they refuse it. What happens? They get their heads cut off. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. So he's talking about the saved dead who are resurrection, context, second coming of Christ. So all those tribulation saints are raised to life at the second coming. They lose their spirits are in heaven. You hear them crying out in heaven, how much longer, Lord, are you gonna carry this thing on? But now their bodies come out of the grave, just like at the rapture. Your spirit's brought back from heaven. You're not in your resurrection body right now. Right now, nobody has a resurrection body but Jesus. Nobody. But he'll bring those departed spirits back from heaven, reunite it with the body in the grave. Who else will rise at the second coming seven plus years later? 
Old Testament saints, Daniel, and tribulation saints. And this is called the first resurrection. Verse six, blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So the concept of a general resurrection of all the saved and all the lost brought before a single throne is not taught. In fact, these two kinds of resurrection are separated by a thousand years. And so Jesus will speak about the kind of resurrection and he'll speak about the time of resurrection. All who are in the graves will hear his voice. Some will come to a resurrection of life. Some will come to a resurrection of death. Two kinds of resurrection. The resurrection of life we call the first resurrection. Did the first resurrection happen all at once? Of course not. When we speak of the first resurrection, it's talking about a kind of resurrection. How do we know that this is not the very first? So you've got some people who say we're here for, during the tribulation and this is the first resurrection when people come out. Now that's inconsistent with what you study in scripture. Remember, there are seven feasts in Israel's history. And one of the feasts is the Feast of First Fruits. The first four feasts were fulfilled at the first coming. The last three feasts will be fulfilled at the second coming. So Jesus dies on Passover. He's in the grave on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He is risen from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits. In 50 days from the resurrection, Shavuot or Pentecost, these are all Old Testament feasts, the Holy Spirit comes. There's still three out in the future. They'll be fulfilled during this seven-year period, ending with the second coming, entering into the millennium. So at first fruits, who's the first one ever to come out of the grave? Jesus. And so at first fruits, they would bring a single sheaf, and they would have a wave offering, and that represented the Lord Jesus, and there'd be a handful of grain that represented a small group of people. We didn't know who they were in the Old Testament. But what happens according to Matthew's gospel well, Matthew tells us in Matthew 27, 52, that after Jesus comes out of the grave, many bodies of Old Testament saints also came out after his resurrection. That was pictured in first fruits. Then there's a big harvest, we call it the rapture, and then there's the gleanings of first fruits. That's gonna happen at the end of the seven year period. And so, are you following me? We, we're, we're tracking? Just, all right, so there's two kinds of, of resurrection, so to speak, a resurrection of life and a resurrection of judgment, John 5, 28 and 29. And the first resurrection is separated from the second resurrection by a thousand years. Just as there are two kinds of death, the first death, which results in burial, in the second death, which is described here before we're done as someone being cast into the lake of fire, even so there's two kinds of resurrections. The first has to do with the resurrection of the righteous. The second has to do with the resurrection of the wicked. And just like all people don't die at once, neither will all people be raised at the same time. So there's a series of resurrections that will take place. So again here in verse 12, I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. Why does he underscore the great and the small? Because he wants us to have imprinted in our thinking no one is overlooked. You could say the big shot and the little shot. The prime minister and the pauper. God's not going to miss anyone. Those who are educated, those who are uneducated. Those who are cultured, those who are uncultured. The great and the small. And I suppose you could further subdivide those great and small into different kinds of sinner, the out-and-out -out sinner like a Madeline Mary O'Hare. There's the self-righteous Pharisee kind who's highly religious, but he's lost. And then there's the, you know, the procrastinator who never makes a decision for Christ, just kicks the can down the road. I was witnessing to a guy today. He was coming out. He said, I want to come out, give an estimate for some work you need done. And he said, by the way, what do you do? He, I said, I'll be in my office. Call me when you pull into the driveway. And I came out, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a pastor. Oh, that's kind of interesting. And I said, do you go to, by the way, do you go to church anywhere? <laughs> You've heard that question, right? Hey, you ever asked that? By the way, do you go to church anywhere? And I go to such and such, I shouldn't probably name it on the air. I said, um, okay, uh, what's it like there for you? So they just asked me to be a deacon. Really, a deacon, wow. 
This guy, 28 years in the Marine Corps, just got out, starting his own business. Major, went in as enlisted, came out as a major. I don't know how that all works. I guess they go to college or something, Josh, and then they get their degree. And so I was impressed with his effort. And can I ask you a question? Sure. Scale of zero to 100. I know I'm not 100. Let me tell you why I'm not 100. And he started ticking off. He said, you know, I've been faithful to my wife, but I lost at women all the time. And oh, no, he ticked off all these things. Okay. What do you think you'd have to do to be 100? I had to change my ways. So well, let me first say you're in a crummy church. I said, I'm not going to dance around the, uh, the edge here. You're in a crummy church. He said, what do, you, what do you mean? Well, number one, they made you a deacon. And according to the Bible, you're not even saved. I said, the Bible would say that your answer will not get you in heaven. And I explained it to him. And I, I took 20 minutes with him sharing the gospel. He said, he said this, was, this appointment was not just to fix your garage. This appointment was for me. <laughs> and, said, and then your pastor, he marries gay people. He says, he does? I said, yes. And you're part of a denomination that in 2015 officially sanctioned gay marriage. I am? I say, look, I'm not telling you you need to come to Community Bible Church, but you need to go to a church where they at least believe the Bible. Why wouldn't they believe the Bible? And so we kind of went on from there. My point is, is the great and small can be classified, and I suppose beyond the procrastinator, there's the church member who's lost. And there's a lot of folks like that where they try to achieve righteousness through some other fashion. Now, notice again the principle by which this judgment is happening. I saw the dead, the great, and the small standing before the throne. Verse 12, the books were open, and again, they're judged according to their deeds. Then a second time in verse 13, they're judged how? According to their deeds. But notice verse 13, the sea gave up the dead, which was an important first century notation because if you read literature outside of the Bible, there's a false Greek myth that if you died at sea, you were annihilated and you could never go into some afterlife. And John wants to underscore that even if you're lost at sea, God's going to get you. Doesn't matter where you died, how you died. If someone dropped an atomic bomb uh, on me, I would be incinerated. But God will find my body someday. And so it's an interesting drop here. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. Death is a synonym for here known as the grave. And Hades is the place of judgment where the soul is. And God's going to drag them all out. And notice again, they're judged according to their deeds. Why are they judged according to their deeds? Well, the scripture says, like in the book of Ecclesiastes, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every secret thing whether it's good or evil. Or Paul said in Romans 2, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they'll give an account for in the day of judgment. In Matthew 16, 27, earlier in this gospel, the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will repay every man, how? According to their deeds. And so it's a theme that runs all the way through Scripture. Why? Because your deeds show whether or not you know the Lord. Titus 2, right? They profess to know God, but by their deeds, their life, they deny Him. And so in the perfect justice of God, the Lord is going to mete out punishment according to their deeds. Think about it. We've already studied this in terms of the Bematos. In heaven, it's a great place for anyone who goes, and I hope you have a reservation there. But it won't be the same for everyone. There's degrees of rewards. And again, we're coming to that and what that will look like and how it will flesh out during the millennial reign and in eternity future. Well, there's degrees of punishment. Hell is awful for anyone who goes there. Listen to this, Matthew 10, 14, and 15. Whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. 
You're kidding me. That's what he said. Beware, Mark 12, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes. They like their greetings, so forth, so forth. Then he says, they devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Remember when Jesus dealt with that evangelical triangle, as we often call it, there in the North Shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he said, look, if the miracles that had been done in Chorazin and in Bethsaida and uh, had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But as it is in the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable somehow in the perfect justice of God for Sodom and Gomorrah than for these three cities. So hell is awful. I don't want to dismiss that because when Jesus describes it in general terms, it's awful for anyone who goes there. But it's not the same. And so why does God wait to the very, very end of time to pull off this judgment? Well, you know, Hugh Hefner died about a decade ago, but he spent his whole life in perversion, producing pornography, and towards the end of his life, he got more creative and used all the various video methods. And people are still being polluted by his work. The people whom he polluted, who followed his example, are continuing to pollute people. And God, who is a perfect God of justice, will cross every T and die to every I, and he'll look at the full impact, even the impact that some have after they die. There are people like Karl Barth, there are people like Walter Rauschenbaum and other theologians that were liberal, but their teachings go on to this day and continue to pollute people and lead people to hell, and God will hold them into account. So he will judge men according to their deeds because one, their deeds will show that they're lost, and two, their deeds will somehow be met out with the perfect justice of God. So hell is horrible for anyone. So when Jesus tells a general, if it is a parable, and we can debate whether Luke 16 is a parable or not, it changes nothing. But when Lazarus dies and he goes to Hades, and again, Jesus never uses an untruth to teach truth. He's in the flame. He's in agony. He's being clean that maybe someone could go and warn his brothers that they might come, not come. And Jesus makes it clear that there's no escape, that it's eternal. We looked at that last week, how the lost goats are cast into the eternal fire. And the word Ionion, eternal, is the same word that modifies eternal life. So if heaven is not eternal, hell is not eternal, and the same word is used to describe in 1 Timothy 6, the eternal God. You'd say God is not eternal. And so when people go soft in the doctrine of hell, and they say, well, you know, hell is gonna burn itself out, or Jesus didn't say that. He says, it's a place where the worm does not die and the fire is never quenched. Now, if a man goes to hell, he's trespassing because God didn't create hell for man. He made it for the devil and his angels, and no one has to go there. They go there because of their rejection of Jesus as Lord. So now go back to this sheet, and let's just first look at the sheep and goats judgment. Next page. Um, and I just want you to see the contrast between this and the great white throne judgment. The sheep and the goat judgment happens uh, after a time of, of tribulation. When does the great white throne judgment? It happens after a time of utopia, after the millennium. The sheep and goats judgment is for tribulation survivors only, only those who lived through the seven years. And Jesus said if those seven years had not been cut short, nobody would have lived. Whereas the great white throne judgment is the loss from every age. I was gonna look up all these scriptures, but we don't have time. You go and fill them and fill, find them out. Between Matthew 25 and, and Revelation 20, they're all there. 
uh, the sheep and the goat judgment concerns all the living Gentiles, the, Gentile, the judgment of the nations. He's not talking about Germany and France and America. He's talking about the singular use of, of Gentiles, of individuals, and that's how it's typically used throughout the New Testament. Don't pray like a pagan, like a Gentile, and so on and so forth. Whereas the great white throne judgment, it's all people, Jew and Gentile alike. Sheep and the goats judgment happens at, after the second coming. The other happens after the millennium. Sheep and goat judgment includes believers and unbelievers. The great white throne judgment, only those who weren't a part of the first resurrection. Lost people only. The sheep and the goat judgment happens from Jesus' throne on earth, Matthew 25, 31, where this judgment, the great white throne, happens between heaven and earth as Jesus is on the throne. On one, they enter the kingdom to rule with Christ for a thousand years or they go straight to hell. On the other, it ends up in the lake of fire. Turn the page again for future judgments. This is what we've been studying. The judgment of the church, the judgment of Jews, the judgment of Gentiles and the judgment of the lost. So the judgment of the church, it's called the Bema. We'll walk down that column first. It takes place in heaven. It concerns church saints only. It's after the rapture. We're rewarded, not punished. Our works are tested with fire. We're not put through the fire. It's not a doctrine on purgatory. And Paul uses that first plural pronoun. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He includes himself in it. It's the reward seat, and we work through that and how it's a reward seat, not a place of punishment. If you miss those sessions, they're all online. The judgment of the Jews concerns the judgment of Israel. It takes place on the earth. It deals with Jewish survivors. It happens at the end of the tribulation. Saved Jews enter the kingdom. They have to pass under the shepherd's rod, Ezekiel 20. In the first half of chapter 25, I could have included that up until verse 30, where he's describing believing versus unbelieving Jews. Then there's the judgment of the Gentiles, also known as the sheep and goats judgment. Happens on earth, dealing with those Gentiles who survived the tribulation. It happens at the end of the seven years. The saved Gentiles enter into the kingdom, the lost into Hades. And again, the basis is how they treated Israel, because how they treated Israel demonstrated whether or not they had true faith in the Messiah or not. And then there's the great white throne judgment, the judgment of the lost. It happens between heaven and earth. It's all the unsaved. It happens at the end of the thousand years. God measures out eternal punishment in hell. Um, if you're not in the Lamb's book of life, then and no one is there because they're all part of the second resurrection. They're judged by their books, by the books where their deeds are recorded. So you, you can't look at these judgments in the specifics of them and say there's just one big judgment in the future. It's impossible to come to that conclusion unless you spiritualize the text. So there's a great danger in doing that, and I know people think, well, it's no big deal. It really is a big deal. The scripture warns, let not many of you become teachers knowing that you incur a stricter judgment. So it is a big deal how we treat the scripture. But how should we apply this? Well. Number one, you know, when you study this fourth judgment, the great white throne judgment, it should help us to understand how much God hates sin. We should hate it too. It should increase our hatred for sin. Just as we cannot bear to think about the horrors of hell, neither can God bear to look on the horrors of sin. He hates it. He nailed his son to a cross for it. And if sin is this bad that it deserves hell, then we shouldn't have a casual view towards sin. And if you do, you should ask God to change that. Secondly, I think the reality of hell should make us more fervent in our witness. And certainly, the pre-tribulational rapture should make us more in tune with the day that we're living in. You've often heard me say when you go into Walmart around Thanksgiving and you see the Christmas decorations go up, or you go in there in, in Walmart in, in, in October around Halloween and you see the Christmas decorations go up, what do you know? Thanksgiving is near. Because Thanksgiving precedes Christmas. And the fact that God has gathered Israel from across the planet 
something that the Old Testament prophet says he does at the end of time. Put them in the land, reconstituted them, made them a nation in one day, as the prophet Isaiah said, gathered them from across the planet, and now there's this growing hatred towards Israel. You know you're in the time frame. You know you're in the time frame because that is supposed to happen at the end of time. That's the term the Old Testament prophets use, the latter days when God will gather the Jews. Moses spoke about it, preached about it, never happened any time in the Old Testament. There was one deportation to Assyria, a second to Babylon. And there was a brief scattering when some of the Roman emperors came in and they scattered not just Jews but Christians. But there was never a time in human history when the Jews were scattered to the ends of the earth in the Old Testament until Jesus comes on the scene and he tells us when it's going to happen. And he tells us it's going to happen with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. They'll scatter you to the four corners of the world. And what happened? Exactly that. And by 136, they rename Israel to, they call it Palestinia. to mock the Jewish people. It's from the root word Philistine. And he calls it Palestinia, Hadrian, the emperor, to mock them and to show his hatred. And by 136, you can't live in Israel. Here they are back in the land. How much time we have? I don't know. I told someone last week, I said, and I often use this illustration, I said, let's just say you know you had... 20 years from now. 20 years you knew for sure Jesus is coming. Would you do anything different tomorrow when you woke up? Well, not really. I mean, I still have to go to work. I still need to put food on the table. still need to take care of my kids. That's exactly right. You occupy until he comes. But the fact that we know we're in that final time frame, though no one knows the day or the hour, but we know the season. It should make us more passionate in our witness. And when we think about the horrors of hell and what people are headed towards, that should put compassion in our heart. I was on the base, and I was talking to one Marine. My son brought me on. I hadn't been on Paris Island in years. I didn't even know they changed the entrance. So I asked Walter, when did they change the entrance? You know, I think it was in 2010. And I said, Gee, it's been a long time. And the base has gone to pot since, I mean, I can't believe how run down it looks. I thought, Marines, man, they starch their shirts, you know, they're squared away. What a, not the image we should be presenting for all these visitors who come on the base, in my humble and correct opinion. <laughs> uh, but I'm talking to this, uh, this captain, and he loves me, and he comes here on occasion, but his family lives in another state, so every weekend he goes home, and he says, well, you know, Pastor, I, I believe in France, what Francis of Assisi said, I, 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 I witness with my life, and when necessary, I use words. And I didn't want to correct him in front of his major, but I hope God will give me a chance to talk to him about that, because his major is so open to the gospel. But that is such a lie. He who witnesses with his life only, only witnesses to himself. People aren't saved by looking at your life. It might give you a platform. People are saved by hearing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The gospel, the power of God unto salvation. And so we should be passionate in our witness. We should be praying and asking God for opportunities to share the gospel. And if you're not sure of your salvation, you have family members who are not sure, you should do everything in your human power as you pray and seek God at the throne of grace that they might come to know Jesus. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we, we, we thank you for the brief pause that we've had these last four weeks speaking of four judgments in the future. We know we haven't looked at the judgment of angels or the judgment of Satan or the judgment of the Antichrist and the beast, but these four broad judgments that relate to people. We're sobered by it. We know, Lord Jesus, you told us that we'll stand before your seat. 
And we thank you that that doesn't put us under pressure because we know that you've given us the spirit as you promised, that as we're yielded to him and we rely upon him, that you're able to perform through us the works that you've ordained beforehand. And in eternity, you reward us for it. In ourselves, we're frail. In ourselves, we're afraid to speak. We recognize that we're in a spiritual battle and if Satan could seal our lips, he would. But help us to be obedient, to preach the gospel to every person under creation where you give us open doors. We thank you because of this imputed, credited righteousness that you've given to us that we can come to your throne of grace tonight. We bring this 16-year-old member, Camilla Ramos, and the fall that she's had and the hip that she's fractured, so young, help her to get through it. Use this in her life in a great way. We pray for a complete and total healing without any residual problems in the future. Thank you for answering the prayers of many in this church for Brooke Erickson's dad at death's door. Thank you for Pastor Josh as he has witnessed to him we know that what he really needs is salvation, to be free from alcohol, and only you can do that. But we pray that through the hardship that he's been through in this close brush with death, that he would seek you. We thank you for Casey Barrett. Thank you for his commitment in our church family to care for families, to help them to have better marriages. And we know through this accident at work, he has been struggling. And we just ask that you might intervene through whatever means you choose to bring healing. Thank you, our Father, for the Awana ministry, for our parents who are taking advantage of it. We pray that more who are able would come. We know for many of the children who come, this is the only place where they will hear of the Lord Jesus. Be with those teachers when they're tired at the end of a long day and they don't feel like coming. Rejuvenate them and encourage them. Thank you for a record number of youth at Frontlines last Thursday. Thank you for what you're doing with the youth in this church. They're in a godless culture where so many are being exposed to wickedness on their own phones. So help them as they face opposition to recognize that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Thank you for our missionaries. Thank you for Bishop Santos as he'll be here on Sunday morning speaking in one of the classes and then to our youth on Sunday night in Awana. Thank you for the 50 new missionaries that we've taken on in the last six weeks in India. We know there's great persecution there to the point where some have had limbs removed, eyes removed for preaching the gospel. Homes burned, churches destroyed. We have so much in this nation and we take it for granted. We know we are at a, a time in our American history, Father, where there's so much that is coming undone. Even President Trump, as he's had two assassination attempts on his life, you alone know where he stands spiritually. I thank you that he has stood with Israel and on many other things he stood positively. We think of our vice president candidate who wants to and is robbing parents' rights in his own state if they want to change their sex, that he's provided a, a state where children can flee to, where parents have no right to touch them or to intervene as they're given drugs and their bodies are butchered. We know this is an hour of wickedness like we've never seen before in America. But we know that you are the one ultimately who raises people up and pulls people down. 
We pray that the church in this hour might be salt and light and represent truth.